If you looked at a map of East Asia, your eyes might settle on the Korea Strait, a narrow stretch of ocean separating the Korean Peninsula from Japan. Beneath these waters lies the proposed route for one of the most ambitious engineering projects in history, the Japan-Korea Tunnel. This undersea marvel would span up to 231 kilometers, connecting South Korea's bustling port city of Busan to Japan's Kyushu region via the remote Tsushima Islands. With sections plunging up to 200 meters below sea level, this tunnel would require advanced boring machines to carve through complex seabed geology. The project promises to revolutionize travel and trade, moving millions of tons of cargo annually and cutting transit times drastically. But beneath the grand vision lie enormous challenges – seismic fault lines, staggering construction costs, and political hurdles. How do you dig through active earthquake zones without risking collapse? And can two nations with a complicated history collaborate on such a massive scale? Let's find out. This is Megalith. Please subscribe and never miss an update on the best mega projects. Let's step back in time to 1917. That's when the first idea for a tunnel connecting Korea and Japan was put on the table. The concept was simple yet monumental. Build a railway under the Korea Strait, a narrow stretch of ocean separating the Korean Peninsula from Japan to seamlessly connect the two regions. By the 1930s, planners envisioned something much larger, a vast network of railroads linking Japan to the Korean Peninsula and beyond into mainland Asia. Central to this vision was the undersea tunnel, enabling trains to travel without interruption between Japan and Korea. Preliminary surveys began, examining the seabed and possible routes. But how could such an idea even be imagined with the limited technology of the time? And how would engineers tackle the challenges of digging beneath the ocean on such a scale? By the early 1940s, the tunnel concept had progressed further. Test drills took place on Tsushima Island to understand the geology of the seabed. Engineers and planners started drawing up blueprints. They estimated how long it would take to build and calculated costs. The goal was ambitious connect Japan to the Asian mainland with a single tunnel beneath the ocean. But time marched on and the world's priorities shifted. It wasn't until the 1980s that the idea made a significant comeback. This time, it wasn't just about transportation, it was about fostering economic ties and cultural exchange. Studies were conducted to assess feasibility and for the first time, real attention was given to environmental and technical challenges. Engineers began boring test tunnels and mapping out routes across the strait. In the 1990s, leaders from both Korea and Japan revisited the idea in discussions. The Channel Tunnel connecting Britain and France had just been completed, proving that such a feat was possible. Excitement grew as new proposals emerged. Routes were outlined and construction methods were debated. Even though challenges like high costs and regional tensions loomed, the tunnel was now seen as a symbol of progress. The 2000s brought new energy to the project. Modern technology made the idea seem more achievable than ever. High-speed trains, advanced drilling techniques, and improved materials could turn the century-old dream into reality. Governments and organizations began serious talks, focusing on the tunnel's potential to boost trade, tourism, and regional cooperation. Test drilling continued, and updated surveys provided valuable insights into the seabed's composition. At its core, the tunnel would serve as both a freight and passenger route, much like the English Channel Tunnel connecting the United Kingdom and France or the Seikan Tunnel, which links Japan's Honshu and Hokkaido Islands. However, the Korea-Japan Tunnel would far exceed these in scope and complexity. The proposed tunnel length ranges between 209 and 231 kilometers, with the undersea portions alone spanning between 128 and 145 kilometers. To put this into perspective, the Channel Tunnel is 15.5 kilometers long, with 37.9 kilometers undersea. So, how do you plan a tunnel stretching over 200 kilometers beneath a busy ocean? Several potential routes have been proposed, each balancing cost, feasibility, and economic impact. The question isn't just where to dig, but how to connect two nations most effectively. One route begins at Gyoji Island, a picturesque South Korean island near the bustling port city of Busan. From there, it crosses to the southern part of Tsushima Island, a Japanese island nestled in the middle of the Korea Strait. The route concludes in Karatsu, a historic city in Saga Prefecture on Kyushu Island, Japan's southernmost main island. This route measures approximately 217 kilometers, with 141 kilometers under sea. Why is this path favored? Engineers prefer it for its relatively shallow water depth of 160 meters, 
and more straightforward geological conditions making it simpler to construct. But what if you bypass Gyoje and start directly from Busan, South Korea's second largest city and one of the busiest ports in Asia? This route takes a more direct approach, crossing to the northern tip of Tsushima and then to Karatsu. At 231 kilometers, it's longer overall, but the undersea section shrinks to 128 kilometers due to increased land connections. But this path crosses a major geological fault line, raising questions about safety and construction challenges. But why would anyone choose this riskier route? Because it offers better accessibility to Busan, a critical transportation hub for South Korea. There's also a third option, a modified version of the Busan route. This plan suggests stopping at Gariokdo, a small island just off Busan's coast, before continuing to Tsushima. Adding the stop helps avoid some geological risks and better integrates the tunnel into South Korea's transportation network. So how do you actually build a tunnel like this? The answer lies in cutting-edge technology. Engineers propose using tunnel boring machines or TBMs, specifically shielded TBMs, which are designed for excavating through soft sediment and rock under high water pressure. These machines would create twin parallel tunnels, one for each direction of travel, connected by cross passages for safety and maintenance. The project would involve multiple construction phases. First, survey teams would conduct detailed geological studies of the seabed using technologies like digital multi-channel sound wave exploration to map the layers of rock and sediment. Once the route is finalized, excavation would begin simultaneously from several points, including land-based portals on Gyoje or Busan and underwater shafts near Tsushima and Karatsu. To minimize risk, the tunnel would be constructed in sections. For example, the stretch between Busan or Gyoje and Tsushima would be built first, followed by the Tsushima-Karatsu segment. Each section would include ventilation systems, emergency escape shafts, and access points for maintenance. The depth of the tunnel varies based on the route. The deepest sections could reach 200 meters below sea level, depending on geological conditions. To withstand the immense water pressure at such depths, the tunnel walls would be lined with reinforced concrete and waterproof membranes. One major challenge is the seismic activity in the Korea Strait. The area is prone to earthquakes due to tectonic movements along the Tsushima-Goto fault line. So how do you keep a tunnel safe in an earthquake zone? Engineers plan to design the tunnel with advanced seismic resistance, using flexible joints and shock-absorbing materials to prevent damage during an earthquake. Water pressure is another significant concern. At depths exceeding 100 meters, the pressure on the tunnel structure can exceed 10 bar, roughly 10 times the pressure at sea level. Shield TBMs are equipped to handle this, but ensuring long-term structural integrity will require rigorous maintenance. The difference in rail systems between Korea and Japan presents another obstacle. South Korea's railways use standard gauge tracks, 1,435 millimeters, while Japan predominantly uses narrow gauge tracks, 1,067 millimeters. This mismatch means trains would need to switch bogies or wheel assemblies or use variable gauge systems, both of which add complexity and cost. Additionally, Japan's rail infrastructure has lower weight limits for freight, requiring extensive upgrades to handle the heavy loads expected in international trade. The projected cost of the Korean-Japan tunnel is approximately $77 billion. This estimate includes excavation, infrastructure, and environmental mitigation. For comparison, the Channel Tunnel cost around $18 billion, and Japan's Seikan Tunnel cost about $12 billion. Maintenance costs for the Korea-Japan Tunnel are expected to reach tens of billions annually. Construction is estimated to take 10 to 15 years, depending on the chosen route and the speed of approvals. Financing such a colossal project would require collaboration between both governments, private investors, and international organizations. One proposal involves creating a public-private partnership to share costs and risks. But what would the tunnel achieve if completed? Once operational, the tunnel could transform regional logistics and travel. It's projected to handle 32.76 million tons of cargo annually, equivalent to 6.55 million standard shipping containers. Freight trains could cut transit times between Korea and Japan by days compared to shipping, making the tunnel an attractive option for industries. For passengers, high-speed trains could connect Busan to Fukuoka, Kyushu's largest city and a major cultural hub, in under two hours. Currently, the journey takes several hours by ferry or plane, making the tunnel a game-changer for travel and tourism. The tunnel could also boost the economies of smaller cities along the route such as Gyoje in South Korea and Tsushima in Japan, by increasing accessibility and encouraging investment. But what do you think will happen to the environment 
when you excavate a 200 plus kilometer tunnel. Excavating a 200 plus kilometer tunnel will produce millions of tons of waste rock and sediment, which must be carefully managed to avoid environmental damage. Engineers will also need to minimize disruption to marine ecosystems during construction, particularly around Tsushima Island, a biodiverse area known for its coral reefs and unique species. The tunnel's long-term environmental impact is less clear. While it could reduce emissions for ships and planes, its energy-intensive construction and maintenance could offset some of those benefits. The Korea-Japan undersea tunnel is more than a transportation project. It's a symbol of connectivity. By linking two nations with a shared history, it has the potential to foster economic growth, cultural exchange, and regional cooperation. The tunnel could redefine the relationship between South Korea and Japan, acting as a symbol of unity and progress. But for now, the question lingers. Can this audacious idea become a reality? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Share them in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss future stories like this.